What's the price of peacekeeping? The United Nations is running out of money to pay for the Blue Helmets, who operate in more than a dozen of the world's conflict zones. So who should foot the bill to protect the world's vulnerable? This is Inside Story. Hello everyone, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. Welcome to Inside Story. They keep the peace, but at what cost? As the United Nations marks the International Day of UN Peacekeepers, we're looking at the undoubtedly vital role peacekeepers play, but also perhaps the flaws in their mandate and the shortfalls in funding that make their jobs that much harder. It's worth starting with the basics of exactly what a UN peacekeeper is. You might know them as the blue helmets for obvious reasons, but it's not some sort of UN army as such. Peacekeepers are actually provided by member states, with most coming from Africa, it has to be said, and they are deployed on missions authorised by the Security Council. And they follow three basic principles, that they are deployed with the consent of the main parties in the conflict, that they are impartial, and that they only use force as a last resort. And this is where they are around the world. As of April last year, in fact, 14 active operations, seven in African countries, uh, the rest in the Middle East, India, Pakistan, plus Cyprus, Kosovo and Haiti. Those operations served by around 88,000 peacekeepers and nearly 13,000 civilians from 122 different countries. But the UN's budget for peacekeeping, it's just $6.7 billion, which is less than half of 1% of global military spending. The US pays almost 30% of the bill. China and Japan are the next biggest contributors with 20% between them. And there is the problem. The UN is now short on cash to fund its peacekeeping and some missions are now threatened. So what can be done? Is it simply just a need for more money and fast? Our discussion in a moment after this report from Al Jazeera's diplomatic editor, James Bays. The UN is holding its annual events honouring the work of its peacekeepers around the world. They serve in some of the most volatile places on earth. Last year, 98 were killed while on duty. Increasingly, they also operate in a very difficult financial environment. Funds are tight, with some budgets being cut. Our peacekeepers need better training and better equipment and their mandates need to be realistic and adequately supported with both resources and political will. For many years, UN peacekeeping has been based on a grand bargain. Western countries, the EU and the US, providing specialised equipment and troops and the vast bulk of the money, while most of the troops come from Asia and Africa. But the system is breaking down. Many countries, but most notably the US, are not paying their share. UN peacekeeping is owed a staggering sum, over $1.9 billion. The countries providing the peacekeepers, countries like Pakistan, which has over 5,000 men and women serving around the world, are the ones currently having to pay most of the costs. So here we are, troop contributing countries, making sacrifices, losing lives in order to maintain international peace and security and facing budgetary challenges. So I think we need to fix this. It needs to be fixed because this remains the most successful enterprise of the United Nations and it should be adequately resourced. The US owes way more than any other country to UN peacekeeping. That's been the case for many years, but under President Trump, the size of the arrears has swelled to over $1.1 billion. A former Obama administration official says it would make real sense to pay up now. It's a little confused on the United States side. The U.S. cares about peacekeeping. We see it. It's in our interest. The U.S. is a larger train, training country for peacekeeping missions, and our diplomats work worldwide to help them succeed because we see the value of these missions. So some of this can and should be sorted out with Congress so that they fully fund the amount that the U.S. owes, and we can resolve this shortfall. The UN Secretary-General knows he must tread carefully. President Trump doesn't take kindly to demands for huge sums from international organisations, even though in this case it's money that everyone agrees the US owes. James Bayes, Al Jazeera, at the United Nations.
All right, let's bring in our panel today to discuss UN peacekeepers. We are starting in Denver in the United States with Mark Goldberg. He's the editor of UN Dispatch, a UN and global affairs news website. On Skype from Florence, Nahari Tadale Maru, who's a former African Union Commission official, now a specialist on peace and security in Africa. And running out the panel from Kiel in the UK is Awol Alo, a senior lecturer in law at Kiel University and a specialist on human rights uh, international law. Gentlemen, lovely to have all three of you with us as we look at marking uh, International Peacekeepers Day. Mark Goldberg, I'll start with you. And I feel we should really, before we get into any of the controversies, look at the importance of peacekeepers. There are 14 missions in place all over the world. If they were not in place, tell us about the sort of vacuum that that might leave. Uh, sure. So as you noted, there are 14 peacekeeping missions around the world deploying about 100,000 peacekeepers. Uh, by and large, these peacekeepers are deployed to places that if they weren't there, there would be a security vacuum and conflict that they are there to keep a, a damper on would fester and would result in all sorts of human rights abuses around the world. You know, in different places, peacekeepers serve different functions. In South Sudan, for example, as that country descended into a really brutal civil war a few years ago, people uh, from surrounding peacekeeping bases flocked to UN peacekeeping compounds to seek protection. So that was like a very direct civilian protection mandate that those peacekeepers were acting against. And there are several different examples like that around the world in which uh, if those peacekeepers weren't there, a vacuum, a security vacuum is, is what um, international relations scholar call it, would form and conflict would just metastasize, perhaps spread to other countries. So they're there really as a lid to keep uh, uh, the conflict in check. I'm interested, Mark, in some of the specifics because I did some research on those individual 14 uh, uh, missions. Now, for example, uh, the one in India, Pakistan, Kashmir, which was established way back in 1949, there's actually only 117 personnel there now. So I would, I'd be interested to know what you think about sort of the importance of that. But then something like Kosovo still got 5,000 people there 20 years after the war. How important is it to keep 5,000 largely uh, troops there, I should add, or uniformed peacekeepers there uh, in a place like Kosovo? Uh, sure. So, so there are several legacy UN peacekeeping missions, which I call them, which were set up you know, decades and decades and decades ago uh, that are there for two main reasons. First, the, the presence of international troops still decades later acts as a deterrent for foreign governments, for the belligerent parties to sort of overrun and capture the territory. And you see that also in, to a certain extent in the Golan and in, in the Sinai, where there are still a small number of international peacekeepers. Kosovo is a little bit of a different story. It's still, um, it's, it's a mid-age peacekeeping mission, let's say, but it, it exists there, uh, much like the, the missions in uh, Kashmir exist, because there still lacks a political will to bring the conflict to a resolve. Mm. And these peacekeepers, their main function is to give uh, international diplomats and politicians the breathing room they need to bring that political will to the table to finally resolve a conflict. Unfortunately, in a case like India-Pakistan, that political will, you know, decades and decades and decades later is still not there. But you've seen other examples. Uh, in, for example, Liberia is a good, mm -hmm. a good one in which, you know, 15,000 peacekeepers were deployed there 15 years ago. This year they left because they were able to give that country and the political factions in that country the breathing space they needed to come together and let the conditions for peace take hold. Mehari Tadale Amaru in Florence, let's bring you in. As I pointed out, out of the 14 missions that there are active around the world, seven of them are in African countries. I'll ask a similar question to you, specifically on Africa. Just how important are the peacekeepers to overall peace and security uh, in many parts of Africa? Thank you, Kamal. I think um, Mark was on spot when he said um, we have to use counterfactual uh, arguments or assessments about the usefulness of peacekeeping missions in general. Uh, uh, ultimately, um, uh, the fundamental question is why do we need peacekeeping? Hmm. And uh, the, the answer is because there are uh, local and national political systems that are broken and they have to be uh, fixed. 
and the fixing is done by the national and uh, regional and also at the same time local political actors. Peacekeeping in general provides the environment for these actors to uh, bring semblance of uh, systems to be restored. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in many of the peacekeeping, that kind of restoration of normalcy is not possible because not enough money, political legitimacy and will is spent on uh, bringing solution. So uh, the counterfactual uh, answer is that actually peacekeeping uh, missions have contributed significantly in reducing deaths and also further uh, escalation of conflicts and devastations in national systems, local areas, and so on and so on, or between countries. But at the same time, uh, at this at this juncture, we have to look at whether they are fulfilling mm. uh, the the kind of function they are supposed to uh, to perform. Uh, and uh, here, uh, the case of uh, Kashmir or Kosovo. Yeah. or uh, DRC, uh, Congo, or Liberia, the main issue uh, that comes into mind is the idea that uh, peacekeeping are backup generators, like backup mm. generators. They don't have to stay long time because you cannot run systems on backup generator. They are supposed to be for short yeah. time to kick in the main source of uh, uh, legitimacy and political process. In some cases, unfortunately, that's not the case. OK, so let's bring in Awal Alo and get his thoughts as well. As Mahari has made a very good point there, we shouldn't... Well, ultimately, you don't want peacekeepers there. You don't want to have to keep the peace. Um, but by the same token, it's hard to imagine a place like, let's say, Darfur or South Sudan or Central African Republic without these peacekeeping forces at the moment. What, in your opinion, might be going wrong that they have to keep them there for so long? So in most cases, peacekeepers are deployed in one of the most unstable, highly fragile, or in some cases, failed states where uh, government institutions, state structures are simply you not know, there to provide the kind of peace and safety that vulnerable populations need. And also, even for different parties, political actors to come together and have that dialogue and conversation about moving the country forward, uh, that situation doesn't exist. So peacekeepers are there primarily to provide that kind of environment, uh, basic protection for vulnerable groups uh, and also uh, a conducive political environment uh, for the various political actors to come together, uh, hammer out a deal to take uh, countries forward. Uh, so that is their primary objective. There are certain peacekeeping missions that have an enforcement mandate in the sense that they can actually participate uh, in fighting as well uh, against one of the parties that are, that are involved. Mm -hmm. Those types of peacekeeping missions are somewhat complicated in terms of uh, their legitimacy as well. But overall, I agree with, with both of you, Gus, that uh, peacekeeping uh, missions, uh, that peacekeeping agenda of the United Nations has contributed significantly in terms of maintaining international peace and security. Gentlemen, I want to look at the composition of these peacekeepers as well, because I think this is interesting, that the bulk... I mean, we're talking 100,000-plus peacekeepers around the world, most of them from Africa and Asia, 7,500 from Ethiopia alone, around 6,000 from India, 5,000 from Nepal. And then you look at, quote-unquote, developed nations, 752 from France, uh, 572 from the UK, 34 from the United States. Mark, I'll come back to you. Why the disparity there? If this is a quote-unquote United Nations, uh, why is there such a disparity between where the peacekeepers come from? Is it just because that, that's where a lot of the conflicts are? Yeah, well, in the case of the United States, it's a political question. In general, uh, American troops uh, and American you know, military officers don't want to put troops under you know, a, the, the so-and-so control of a, of a foreign military officer. But it's sort of a grand bargain, though, when it comes to the United States, because uh, you know, as the introduction of this episode noted, the U.S. pays the bulk 
of the cost of peacekeeping missions around the world. The United States is still uh, the global leader when it comes to efforts to maintain international peace and security around the world. So it does see value in funding developing countries from sending their troops to hot spots around the world. And the developing countries themselves get a lot out of this. Not only do they get you know, training and prestige and political uh, power that comes from being what's called a troop contributing country, they're also compensated to the rate of about $1,400 per troop per month mm. uh, when they send their troops to these missions. So the grand bargain is, is, is working. It breaks down, though, when the funding isn't there mm. and those troops that are deployed don't have the equipment and the personnel and the logistics backups that they need to effectively carry out their mandate, which is where a lot of the problems we're seeing in UN peacekeeping comes today. I'll come back to the issue of funding in a moment, but Mahari, can I ask you, do you agree with that, the idea that for Ethiopia, for example, to have around 7,500 uh, peacekeeping troops as part of the UN force is, is good for them, is a, is a, a potentially positive outcome? Well, the, uh, the various countries have different kind of... Uh, or varied kind of justification for participating in peacekeeping. Uh, in general, in the case of Ethiopia specifically, Ethiopia has historical background where collective security was uh, critical in its history. Uh, you recall uh, the invasion of Italy of Ethiopia long time ago during the Second World War and before uh, Ethiopia was seeking for collective security under the, the League of Nations first. And when the League of Nations failed, under the UN. So there is historical justification for that, and it informs the foreign policy of the country. Mm. There are many countries similar to that, like Rwanda and others, who have historical justification for involvement uh, in peacekeeping. But generally speaking, the categorization that exists is poor countries uh, uh, sacrifice in blood, and rich countries uh, contribute in financial terms. That is a kind of just uh, expression that is uh, commonly used. Mm. So that is not really um, a significant problem in general, but uh, it, it shows also the sacrifice is higher uh, for the peacekeeping troops which, have, uh, which are on the ground and other countries not willing really to come in to, to put uh, troops on the ground. Uh, well, I know your thoughts on that. The, the, the way, the way Mahari described that, it, it sort of it got to me a little bit. He said, "You know, developed nations pay in money, and, and developing nations play in, in blood." It doesn't, it, it doesn't seem right that way. That's that sort of imbalance. Yeah, I think my views on this are more aligned with uh, Dr. Mari's point, because uh, if you actually look back, uh, there is no explicit constitutional mandates or constitutional basis for peacekeeping operation uh, in the United Nations Charter. Although it is widely accepted as one of the most novel kind of innovation of the United Nations in terms of keeping international peace and security, one of the reasons why a peacekeeping mission of that sort is invented is precisely because that is an excellent and also, uh, you know, apparently legitimate way of distributing responsibility for maintaining international peace uh, and security for wealthy countries. So they can simply put in resources which they have, mm. which they can also benefit from the existing international order uh, and, and pay into the system. Uh, and poor countries who don't have the resources uh, would basically contribute uh, via, via troops. So that, in a way, is really a reflection of how uh, messed up the international legal order is. And I, I also disagree with, with the point that Mark made, which is um, that the United, the United States continued to be a global player in, in stabilizing the international legal order. And I think the U.S. certainly was. Uh, but over the last uh, few years, what we see is the retreat of the United States from the multilateral international mm. uh, organizations and also from uh, the kind of rules-based international legal order in which it played a very critical part in establishing. Uh, so, so, you know, there is, there is a bargain, certainly, but I think there are very serious uh, moral issues in terms of how that responsibility is yeah. shared. Mark, that retreat is quite significant, isn't it? And I'm, I'm reading an article which you wrote where you said, 
Well, first of all, Antonio Guterres says that there's a $2 billion uh, arrears, if you like, in payments to the peacekeepers. But also, you said the problem is the Trump administration hasn't been paying its dues in full and has racked up arrears of about $750 million. Why? Yeah, that, that's right. Well, it really comes from a quirk in U.S. policymaking towards the United Nations in which American diplomats and diplomats from around the world uh, negotiate amongst themselves on what's called a scale of assessments. This is how much each country will pay into UN peacekeeping. Every couple of years, they enter these negotiations, and the most recent one resulted in the U.S. diplomats at the UN agreeing to pay a little over 28 percent of the UN peacekeeping budget. However, U.S. Congress refuses to pay that amount. They've imposed an arbitrary cap of 25 percent of U.N. peacekeeping budget that they will allow the U.S. to pay into U.N. peacekeeping. That gap between what the U.S. is assessed and what Congress allows it to pay results in these accumulating arrears at the U.N. On top of that, you have the Trump administration that uh, makes a budget request to Congress that significantly underfunds uh, what UN peacekeeping is owed. So the result is U.S. that's not paying its dues on time and in full, mm. and that results in missions that are not able to effectively carry out their mandates. Mahari, could it be also if we're talking about funding and funding shortfalls, that some of the controversies involving UN peacekeepers have an impact. The fact that between 2004 and 2016, there were 2,000 allegations of sexual exploitation and abuse. There was a, a child sex trafficking ring uncovered in Haiti. There has been a lot of negative news associated with the peacekeepers as well. I wonder if that affects their funding. I very much doubt, Kamal, uh, that will be the main reason. Uh, first of all, like uh, the other speakers, uh, guests have uh, mentioned, uh, the um, erosion of multilateralism and international solidarity is at the center. All countries are now inward looking in the US and also in Europe. Uh, they are facing serious crisis internally that uh, uh, makes it difficult for them also to come out and show international solidarity. I think the abuses were there even more before uh, these changes in the international landscape came. But let me repeat the first point I brought earlier. Hmm. The reason why we need peacekeeping in the first place is to serve as the backup generator for short time to hmm. sustain, support local solutions, national solutions to political conflicts. The primacy of politics is important. If generators are run, a backup generator are run for a long time, they will fail. So peacekeepings are failing because there is fatigue, uh, there is resource exhaustion, political will and legitimacy even of local communities. Uh, perception of peacekeeping is changing signif significantly. Mm. Earlier in your introduction and also in our discussion, uh, we excluded the AMISOM, the Somalia mission, because it's not considered as peacekeeping. Mm. But increasingly, in Africa or elsewhere, peacekeeping is going to be changed drastically because the kind of challenge they have to face and the kind of challenge they are to address in terms of political solutions, bringing uh, fragmentation, political fragmentation to end yeah. at local level is becoming a challenge. So in my opinion, it's a mix of many reasons, uh, partly because the international community is failing its mandate and role because countries that are supposed to lead this kind of initiatives are internally embroiled and they are retreating, like that has been said, from their, their role. And at the same time, uh, the functionality and efficacy of peacekeeping is questioned from legitimacy perspective from local communities or even in terms of uh, being exhaustive. You know, in the RC, MONUSCO for the last uh, 20 years, even before we had UN mission in the RC, where are we now? How much did we spend in this peacekeeping? More than 20 billion US dollars the past two or two decades or so. Yeah. And 20 billion means uh, 40 years uh, budget of African Union or five years budget of the RC itself. And this okay. could have brought a lot of change in the political landscape if it was used for the long-term solutions on the ground. Gentlemen, I hate saying this because I've really enjoyed this discussion, but we're out of time. I'm going to have to leave it there. So Mark Goldberg in Denver, uh, Mahari Tadalumaru in Florence and Awal Alo in Kiel. Thank you so much for joining us.
And thank you for watching. Plenty more for you online at aljazeera.com. You can see this program or any of our other editions by visiting Inside Story in the show's menu. We're at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story for further discussion. We're on Twitter at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Kamal AJE if you want to tweet me directly. Thanks for joining us. See you again soon.